I was saying to her upstairs just now that we, I think, view politics in a very similar way. I read her book about a year ago on Margaret Thatcher. And what she did is what I've tried to do in this book and how I will reflect for a few minutes is that she worked for Margaret Thatcher. I didn't work for these prime ministers. I knew some of them. Um, and although she disagreed with a lot of the policies, she viewed some of the dilemmas and constraints and nightmares of power partly through her. And that's what I've tried to do with the prime ministers. I don't sort of attack them from the left or the right and so on. That would be so predictable. But look at how things seemed to them and how they responded, sometimes well, sometimes terribly, um, when they were in power. And I will also reflect a bit on how Boris Johnson is so different from the Prime Ministers up to Theresa May in every respect. I haven't got time to go through all the characteristics, but I think there are two maybe three essential qualifications for leadership, which are rarely explored that often, if at all. One is this, that the really smart prime ministers are acute readers of the political stage. In the United Kingdom, it's not a presidential system. The political stage is cluttered a lot of the time. And the skillful leaders know almost by instinct how far they can go. Thatcher was a brilliant, instinctive reader of the political stage. She was restless and impatient and didn't spend time analysing what was going on in too much depth. She just sensed it. So, for example, in 79, when she won an election, she still didn't feel wholly free to follow her kind of unyielding and, in some ways, I think, simplistic convictions. But, so she appointed loads of people in her cabinet who she viewed with disdain in quite big positions, the so-called wets. Ian Gilmore was in there, someone who was well to the left of Tony Blair. Um, Norman St. John Stevens, Jim Pryor, who when she felt strong, she punished by, she sacked most of the others, she punished him even more by sending him to Northern Ireland. And she did this when she sensed that the space had opened up when she had the freedom to move. And that was when the left split formally. When the SDP was formed, she kind of knew instinctively that she had the room to move, and she did. In the summer of 81, the SDP was on its way. She appointed Norman Tebbit and like-minded cabinet ministers, and she was off. And there are others who had to do the opposite of recognising that they had virtually no room to move. Prime Ministers in a hung parliament. Brackets, Boris Johnson now. So people like Wilson, Callaghan, Major towards the end. Major put it this way, he said, look, to his, one of his party conferences, you might not like what I'm doing, but I have no choice. There's a hung parliament. I have to twist and turn every day to keep this government going. Such was his level of transparent despair. He described the agony of it. Wilson, when he resigned, looking about 95, too, said it was very hard work, losing votes in the House of Commons, wooing others, and he was quite clever at it. He deployed a wiliness to keep the show on the road, Others reached out. Callaghan, when he took over, knew that the only way he could survive was to form a pact with the Liberals. Deeply tribal, he did it. He had no choice. They all, in their different ways, looked at what was available to them on the political space and acted with skill, guile. Um, and compare that with Boris Johnson. He is in a hung parliament and has behaved as if he had a majority of about 250. And the period which fueled, I think, his instinctive delusional character was August, when parliament wasn't sitting. So he could go around making pledges, door dial, October the 30th, door dial, blah, 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 as if he was in total command. And then, when Parliament returned, 
reality returned too. All hell broke loose. Parliament passed a law stopping him from going for a no-deal Brexit. He said, he thought, ah, call an election, call an election, oh, sort it out. Sort it. Parliament stopped him from doing so. And suddenly he realised, but he hadn't thought about it in advance, that in a hung parliament, it is an unglamorous, hard grind. It's not a great, glamorous crusade, which Cummings and he fought during the Brexit referendum. But too late. He's not a reader of the stage. Who you regard as the best of these prime ministers will be deeply subjective. But one measurement we can all agree on is how long have we got? The election winners. Clearly to win an election is a precondition to securing power. And when I wrote the book, it seemed to me that the election winners of the modern era were very different. Wilson, Wilson always used to show off, I won four elections out of five, um, which he did. Uh, he wasn't always an accurate narrator, but that was true. Um, or sort of. Some of them were very close. Um, Thatcher won all those landslides and Blair won three elections. They were the big winners. And though they had little in common, the three of them, they had one thing in common, which has led me to believe that this too is an essence of leadership. They were storytellers. They sought at all times to make sense of what they were doing. Most leaders, and at the moment I would say this applies to all leaders with the partial exception of Nicola Sturgeon, rarely address the why question. Why are they acting in the way they are? They might assert things. Johnson, well, we're out on October the 31st. Brexit. Why is it such a good thing? What is the framing of the argument? The election winners frame arguments. Wilson did it at the beginning when he was on a roll, talking about harnessing the white heat of technology. It was clever. The white heat of technology implied modernity, but the harnessing was important too. It implied a view of an active state after a long period of Tory rule. Thatcher did it again instinctively. She didn't hire many spin doctors. She had civil servants and devoted civil servants doing the press. But she too told stories. Some of it was nonsense, but it was accessible nonsense. Uh, monetarism, she explained by talking about her father and the, you know, my father never spent more than he earned. And the government should not spend more than it earns. People say, oh, kind of makes sense. Now, of course, it doesn't. But she told stories and people engaged with the storytelling. Harold Wilson also, he always used to say, if you vote Labour, butter will come down in price. He sort of knew, the, oh, oh, I quite like the idea of cheaper butter. Yeah, I'll vote Labour. You know, there was a sort of, he was probably more academic than any of the prime ministers, but he, he learned a way of saying, eh, if you vote Labour, cheaper butter and maybe sugar too. Oh, right, OK. Um, there was a constant conversation. And Blair, too, around the clock, his press conferences, his interviews. If, you know, we're on the radical centre, right? So if you want reassurance, we're centrist, right? OK? <laughs> if you want change, we're radical. Now, again, that raises 25,000 questions, but he framed arguments. He sought at all times to explain why. And they are the election winners. They are not, I think, the deepest policy makers. I think, actually, rather depressingly, two of the modern prime ministers who thought most deeply about politics, Europe, international affairs, read widely, were two of the shorter serving, who had traumatic periods in power. And they, they were Heath, to my surprise, and Brown. Brown was an avid reader, a bibliophile with great curiosity. He was a chancellor for 10 years. And so when the financial crash came, he was able to respond in a way that was epic. <laughs> Heath, you might disagree with it, some of you, got us into Europe. Macmillan, a huge figure, had tried and failed. He got us in. It was all framed around his upbringing in the 20s and 30s and his travels to Europe and so on. They thought deeply. But that was not necessarily a key to winning elections. Neither of them, well, Heath did in 1970 to his surprise. But after that, that was it.
They had hellish periods in office, but thought deeply. Another lesson from the Prime Ministers is... <coughs> got three minutes, Torsten? Um, look, I could go on for much longer, but I won't. Um, is an interesting one in the light of recent events and quite a sort of Shakespearean thing. The, the, when you look at these people who seized the crown in different ways, it's all very Shakespearean. And one of them is this, that the prime ministers who sought an early election moved towards their doom. In Shakespeare's time, there was a theory that if you disturbed the natural order of things, you unleashed forces that destroyed yourself. Macbeth, trying to get the crown off Duncan by killing him, moved towards his doom. King Lear divided up his estate and was homeless in the storms. Heath called an early election in 74, posing the question, who governs? And the answer came back, not you. He never ruled again. Gordon Brown, enjoying a sunny honeymoon that he hadn't anticipated, he for had forgotten what it was like to feel popular, was enjoying a honeymoon of bliss, and he contemplated an early election, and when he didn't hold it, he moved towards his doom. And by the way, he knew it. I saw him the Monday after he had called the election off, and he was literally head in his arms. And he said to me, I haven't murdered anyone. Why am I in such trouble? But he knew he was. And famously, Theresa May did call an early election, uh, lost her party's tiny majority, and staggered inevitably towards her demise. Never a sunny day in number 10 again. And yet, Boris Johnson has now tried twice to get an early election at a point where the forces at play are already unruly. Uh, you have the SNP threatening Tory seats in Scotland, a mini, perhaps not so mini, who knows, Lib Dem revival, Brexit party lurking. It is at the very least a warning of what might happen to a prime minister calling yet another early election. But I'll conclude on this, that Boris Johnson, I don't think has reflected on any of these lessons of recent prime ministers. I'm probably the only one in this room who has read most of his columns. Now, political <laughs> columnists, on the whole, write a lot about the dilemmas of power, what a prime minister should do if they want to get from X to Y. He never did. It's probably why he was much better paid and more popular than most political columnists. His were kind of P.G. Woodhouse-style polemics, he made assertions, he made claims, he was provocative and mischievous, but he was not um, a strategist, he was not interested. Even his book on Churchill was more about a man with a mission than exploring the dilemmas of power. It's partly autobiographical, of course. Um, he's not interested in these strategic objectives and goals and dilemmas. And there are a whole list, I think, of essential qualifications of being a prime minister. And I don't think he meets any of them objectively. That is not a prediction that he's doomed to fail. You cannot make predictions on the basis of the recent past, but it is just about the only guide we've got. But what you can say is this, and I'll finish on this, that if he does succeed, in other words, if he rules for some time to come, it will be by breaking all those conventions and orthodoxies. It will be as if political will is enough to overcome the democratic constraints that made, in their different ways, the lives of all these prime ministers, not ones of imperial arrogance, imperious arrogance, but more one of neurotic, fearful kind of paralysis for a lot of the time I explore in that book. Um, so we're in new wild times, but this at least provides a context to that. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>